welcome. Uh, appreciate you guys uh, taking the time uh, to join, and, and thank you, Noah, for uh, continuing to put on uh, great events, uh, giving us an opportunity to have a, a bit of a, a deeper conversation coming out of the um, main stage uh, interview that we just, uh, that we just did uh, with Ankur. Um, for those of you who, who weren't there and, and, and didn't hear a little bit of uh, what, what we chatted about on the main stage, um, the, uh, the idea of what we're getting into here, and this is actually something that, that we believe in pretty strongly, and I think the, um, the set of uh, great panelists we have here believe in, which is that um, building a successful business needs to extend beyond kind of the boundaries of a singular country. You're going to have to probably expand your geographic vision, um, at least regionally, uh, if not globally, uh, to be successful. And there, there's a lot of uh, great data out there uh, to back it up. But if you even just look over the last five years at um, successful IPOs of software businesses, 92% of those companies had a pretty significant global footprint outside of their home market where they started. Um, and, you know, the reason is when you actually look at most um, software businesses, uh, the geographic boundaries that we once knew have come down so much because of the technology that we all work in. And if you're not playing in those other markets, how are you going to be the number one player in your market? And given the power curve that goes on around valuations, if you're not the number one player, it's hard to have a meaningful valuation. And that number one player gets so much more leverage in their ability to both raise money and do acquisitions and stay ahead of others. Um, and so uh, let me introduce um, kind of the distinguished panel here, but let's have a conversation. We're going to get into some questions, but also love to open it up to, to the audience and have a little bit of um, uh, interactive here. So. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Ankur from uh, Kareem. Uh, for those of you who don't know Kareem, uh, they are uh, one of the largest uh, ride hailing uh, companies in the world now. Um, they have focused on the Middle Eastern and, and Muslim uh, countries um, that, that are outside of the Middle East, um, which is when you actually look at the size of that potential TAM is humongous. And so uh, outside of, you know, essentially the U.S. and, and um, Asian ride, ride hailing. This is, <laughs> this is the peak of, peak of the market. And they've done a fantastic job staying uh, ahead, uh, even as Uber has come in pretty aggressively um, after them. Um, Hugh from Anomaly, who's building um, uh, some really great uh, security uh, products uh, that aren't necessarily just at the, uh, you know, getting trapped at the CISO layer, but actually bubbling up with true value that can be. Uh, disseminated uh, throughout the organization. And as you might imagine, with product like this, he's being naturally pulled by his customers to, to other parts of the world. And I think there's going to be some interesting questions about when and how. And it's not just that. He comes from prior experience scaling um, other large businesses. So how, how is that playing out in, in this, um, this route? And um, Alex, um, in the uh, mobile and carrier technology space, has already built one amazing business with, with white pages, saw an additional piece of technology that they started building inside. And even though white pages is doing uh, incredibly well, you know, um, I don't know uh, uh, wh where the public numbers are actually talked about, but it, for most people, it would be a, a tremendous success. He decided to step down from that and actually take this piece of technology and scale it again. And you know how can that affect you know some of the the decisions um, uh, around how you are um, uh, driving business? But I thought maybe what I would um, to, would, would start with is is kind of the, the question of what's the right time to start thinking about other geographies um, in um, uh, the life of your company? And, and actually, Hugh, I thought maybe I'd start with you, given you know some of the pull you're feeling and some of your, your prior uh, prior experience. And actually, I'll you mine. Hello, everyone. So um, we are a Silicon Valley company headquartered in Redwood City, which is in the heart of Silicon Valley. Uh, the company is about four years old. And um, I would say our philosophy is first to establish ourselves in our domestic market um, and then expand in a certain order. 
And so the order in which we've been expanding is about 18 months ago, we opened an EMEA office in the UK. So we see EMEA um, as, for us, the second natural place to be after um, getting launched and established in the US. And in a sense, um, in cybersecurity, um, first of all, threats are pretty global in nature. And however, different geographies have different um, regulatory environments. And so you have to consider, do you have a product that's uh, mature? Do you have a product that's stable, um, has built a brand that can be recognized outside of your own borders? And next, are you able to provide a solution that deals with the particular um, intricacies of your target geographies? Um, you know, Alex, it might be interesting because I know we had a conversation about this, you know, uh, taking off of what Hugh's talking about with the product. How, how do you decide, like, is it about nailing the product first and then expanding? Or is it about starting to think about those other places that you go, go into, you know, before you've, like, really nailed your, your core market? How are you thinking about that? Well, I, I, I can just share my own perspective on this. And, of course, I'd love to say that we had a perfectly mapped out roadmap and, and attack the world, you know, in an organized manner. Um, but I think the truth is, you know, we, we had a successful service in the U.S., and uh, we were truly thrust upon the, the, the global scene with, um, with a great partnership that we were able to land with Samsung Mobile. And uh, as of a little bit over a year ago, we were uh, deeply integrated into uh, Samsung uh, handsets, into the phone app itself um, in, uh, in well over 35 countries. Um, so uh, f from our perspective, it, it was certainly not something that was organized. I think um, uh, you know, after we got that deal, we were just in a mad scramble. And that scramble, to some extent, continues today. And, and it's a good scramble, because it's all about growing and, and servicing more users in more countries to, uh, to fully support them as well as possible. So I think in terms of you know, the pros and cons of, of our approach, it's certainly a, a very efficient approach in terms of you, know, you get users, you get some traction in uh, international geographies. And uh, uh, you, know, you, can, you actually have people to talk with uh, in, in terms of how are they experiencing the product, what can we do better, and so forth. It's very expensive sometimes to, you know, to, to retain user groups and simulate what the service might be like uh, internationally. So that's, uh, that's my perspective. No, it makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and Ankur, um, you know, in addition to the product, you know, sometimes there's quite a few different regions that you could go into. And, you know, there's a little bit of a question of how do you prioritize them? And what's the pace at which you need to do it, especially, you know, when you may be facing down competitors who are, um, you know, aggressively entering. How do you think of the balance between, um, you know, going deep in a particular country versus starting to add additional ones, especially in your particular case, as you go into different countries, you have to build a whole infrastructure every time you do it. It may not scale quite as naturally. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so I, I think that's right. Uh, in the O2O, so in the online to offline businesses, um, the, the challenge is, uh, is multi-layered because uh, you not only have to build a product that uh, is relevant for, uh, for different markets, uh, but also manage uh, an infrastructure of people, uh, things, processes, systems um, that operates over uh, sort of international boundaries, whether it's uh, whether it's legal or payment or uh, or insurance or training, uh, it, you need to make sure that your ability to manage also scales uh, across borders. So there is definitely a second layer of that challenge. Um, I, I think in our case, you know, as as Alex said, um, uh, and and as as Hugh alluded to, we were dragged into it by our uh, by our customer. Uh, McKinsey was our first customer, and uh, they had uh, certain corridors in which their consultants traveled, uh, and so we uh, uh, were compelled to serve uh, the the client uh, in those corridors. And we were fortunate to have uh, built our quality and expectation of service around a customer that was relatively demanding, uh, so that when we pivoted to a consumer product, uh, we had a reliability that our competitors. Uh, did not have uh, at the time because they had not invested in that operational infrastructure. 
You know, Hugh, it might, might be interesting, you know, thinking um, a business that's, that's maybe a, on the other end of the spectrum in terms of as you start to think about scaling, many of the pieces of your business, the technology, you know, how people buy, these types of things, relatively similar in some of these places, and there are many very just enterprise global customers already um, as you're going into to different regions. And at least, you know, one of the uh, things that, that I find is, is I have conversations with, with companies that, that have, you know, a very naturally scaling product, their instinct is, you know, really the only challenge is language. Um, you know, where do you stick, you know, the, the, the challenges as you scale, you know, where does language fit relative to other things that you really have to think about if you're going to get it right? Um, I would say that has actually been evolving significantly over time. Um, as you alluded to, uh, many of our customers from the very beginning were multinational corporations. Um, a lot of our customers are large uh, global enterprises. And so we had customers in many geographies before we ever opened an office anywhere outside the US. Um, and what we are finding more and more over time is that the requirements for um, having your product support multiple languages are much less uh, of a barrier, if you will, than they used to be. Even 10 years ago, uh, you would need to localize all your products into multiple languages before you could even consider setting foot in new geographies. And uh, now most of the end users, especially in an IT um, kind of environment, um, are actually um, using English maybe in their operation, they're operating products that are in English. And so the requirements are a little different. The requirements are more being able to support pass through of the native language, supporting double byte in Asian uh, geographies, for example. But you don't necessarily have to translate your entire product. You would actually focus more on translating the collateral, your data sheets, your sales materials, your promotional information, and your website, uh, but not so much having to convert the entire product. Um, that's our, that's been our experience. You know, Alex, a, as you've looked at the different um, carriers and in, in regions that, that you've gone into, um, you know, how much have you had to customize the product beyond language and um, uh, in, in support and in materials to um, address unique uh, local needs? And do they vary that much? Yeah, si significantly, I think, is the answer. Um, so, so first of all, let me say, you know, we are an American headquartered uh, business and I was fortunate to have good success in uh, starting uh, another company in the U.S. that grew into a, a, a nicely, uh, uh, you know, uh, in terms of market share and users and so forth, American company. And um, uh, I, I think it's challenging uh, sometimes to, especially with the American mindset, we, we're so spoiled that we have a huge domestic market to serve. And you can build a very meaningful uh, business without needing to expand internationally. Um, but you leave so much market opportunity on the table. And, and the American market share is absolutely declining, and if, whether you look at in terms of you know, world population or even GDP as a percentage of, of global GDP. So you leave a ton of opportunity on the table. So uh, we, from a very early stage, said, you know, we're going to be an international first company, international as in, you know, uh, X US, and um, and that's a very un-American view. I think the, the the traditional view is, you know, you really uh, dominate the US market, and once you've done that, then maybe you expand internationally. But what you do is you really leave a lot of opportunity out there for international competitors to. Uh, to win their respective markets, and by the time you get out there, then it's already too late in some cases. So I think really a watershed moment was uh, WhatsApp. Um, they, uh, you know, they came from nowhere. Um, you know, m me and a lot of my friends in the U.S., you know, we, we've been watching text messaging for quite some time, and then this company that none of us, uh, a service that none of us were using or heard of, suddenly sells for 19 billion dollars to Facebook. So, so, so that was an important moment for us, I think, in really t in terms of thinking international first. Um, so, so what does that mean uh, uh, for us? I think it's, yeah, certainly it's, it's about more than just translating, um, uh, uh, you know, as far as, you know, supporting local languages and so forth. That's, that's kind of the easy part. The tough part is being sensitive to, uh, to international cultures and norms and so on. And there's a lot of, you know, specific stuff uh, to our service um, in terms of, you know, understanding what a phone number means, for example, or who the caller is. So one feature on our app, for example, is detecting scammers and fraudsters. 
Um, and um, you know, here in the UK, I think you know some users are played by PPI scams or you know folks who who uh, who call about you know have you been in a car crash recently and so on. In other countries, like in Mexico, for example, I, I bet you if I did a show of hands here, have, have any of you guys here in the audience, to the extent you actually live in the UK, have you ever received a PPI phone call or car insurance uh, uh, claim? Okay, so in Mexico, if I if I ask the same question. Uh, uh, hands would, would shoot up about, you know, have you ever been uh, the recipient of a extortion phone call? Um, and uh, uh, I mean, these are, you know, really, really um, uh, uh, harmful calls. So basically someone will call and, and there'll be a baby screaming in the background <coughs> or a kid screaming in the background. Of course, uh, and, and the fathers say that this is your kid and don't hang up the phone. Uh, if you do terrible things will happen, walk down to the bank and, you know, wire transfer some money over. So, you know, it's, it, it's really fascinating. Uh, and that type of localization, um, that can't be done just through language. So it, I think it's really important to understand, you know, the, the mindset of the users. So that's a long answer. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Um, and look, we can have a conversation up here among us, and we've got a lot of other questions we can get into. But um, now that, that we've got, uh, you know, a number of people have come in from, from lunch and stuff, I thought I'd ask just a few questions to the audience so we get to know kind of who's out here and, and where you guys have some interest um, uh, in this topic. Um, so uh, just to begin with, um, how many of you are, are representing a, a startup um, or a, a company where uh, building that international footprint is kind of an important part of, of what you're trying to achieve? Okay. Um, how, how many of you are um, investors or, or in, in some other area, but you're kind of interested in understanding how companies are approaching this type of uh, topic? Okay, so we've got kind of an even split. Good. So, so, so we know some of this. Um, uh, how many of you are, um, are headquartered or domiciled um, uh, in the UK? A few. Uh, and Europe? More broadly? Okay. Um, any any folks from the U.S. or other parts of the world? Nobody. Okay, so this is a, a, a European-centric crowd. Um, uh, of of you that um, are, are running a business from from the U.K. or or Europe, uh, how many of you have uh, currently expanded outside of um, you know the European U.K. geography? For, for those of you go, who have, just shout out, where, where, where was your first uh, other place to go? The US. Asia. Where in Asia? Singapore. Singapore. Brazil. Brazil? Okay. Fantastic. We didn't get all U.S.'s, which is, you know, too frequent when you ask this question. Everybody's like, yeah, we go to the U.S., you know, we'll go to. Um, uh, you know, a, as, a, as an audience, um, you know, if, if you're thinking about, um, you know, some of these internationalization points here and you came to this, this talk because you were hoping to, to perhaps learn some things uh, from some folks that, that have been around not just with this business but with some prior business, um, uh, you've heard some of the, the, the conversation um, uh, here up front. Um, Love to hear one or two like major challenges that you continue to wrestle with, and you feel like you know you haven't seen a, a great answer for, or or something else. Yeah. I think it's going back to uh, where you go. So we we typically went to Europe to visit corporates similar, and it's very big. But you've got those sort of two elements of it. Do you how do you decide which of those are most important? So do we go to France next? Uh, I don't know, Anker. You want you want to chat about this a little bit because you you guys could have a an opportunity to expand in some different dimensions, and you know you have gone to Pakistan and a few other places. So like, how did you decide? Yeah, I mean, it, I think it depends a lot on your uh, your own capabilities. Uh, you know, one of our lenses is uh, we don't necessarily want to go to a market where there's a lot of competition already. Uh, so even if it's culturally similar and big, you may still not want to go there. Um, frankly, you know, for a long time, one of our uh, most important lenses was, um, you know, can you get there within three to four hours of flight time? 
um, and uh, <laughs> you know, and then there were some of these others. So I, I think there's a there's just a practical set of considerations around your team, um, you know, where your product is most. Uh, um, where do you have to put in the least amount of effort to adapt your product, uh, least amount of effort as a as a management team, and then least amount of stress on your uh, on your capital? <laughs> I think that's probably uh, what gives you gives you the answer. And then I think if there's a there's a customer or someone who's taking you there, it makes it, it makes it a lot easier. Hugh, you know, I think you probably come at it from a, a completely different side, right? Because obviously this is a business that's kind of tied up in some very specific, you know, uh, customer types are trying to serve, which are geographically constrained. You have a lot less geographic constraints. So, you know, Europe is one way you could go, but certainly there's a lot of, you know, large corporates in Asia that care a ton about um, security. You know, it, it goes to a little bit of this question of do you prioritize, you know, English speaking and things that feel a little bit closer or do you go to some of the other, you know, emerging areas where you could have a ton of uh, enterprise customers? Sure. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of factors both um, on the side of what business you're in and then on the side of what are the conditions um, in the target geography. So, for example, if you're in a consumer-facing business, I think the, the decision criteria are very different. Uh, for us, we're essentially focused on large enterprise. And so it becomes less about the product and more about what are the challenges of being in a particular market. So, of course, for us in the US, coming to the UK requires almost no translation. Um, but when, when you go to other geographies, the, co the considerations may be what kind of partner do you need to be able to actually access the market. So if you go to China, for example, then you're going to want some kind of inside partnership um, to be able to actually access the market effectively. Um, if you go to places like Japan, um, what we found is that the dynamic of establishing the customer relationships is very different. You could be working with a very large organization, uh, but the initial relationship is going to be a very small pilot or a small engagement, uh, not at all proportional to the size of the enterprise that you're selling to. And once you build the relationship, it grows. Um, similarly, if you're going into a market like France, my mother is French, um, you'll find essentially a more um, favor towards native companies that are competing uh, with the international vendors. And so then again, you have to be careful to understand what groundwork you need to do to actually uh, get a toehold in a market like that. So it, it really depends on who is your product aimed at and figuring out do you need to find people who have very strong local knowledge um, or what is it you need to do to approach that market successfully? And actually, I think a, a natural a follow-on, and I'd love to hear from the few of you who have done some of this, this expansion, um, you know, there's this big kind of organizational question, right? Do you, you know, maintain, you know, your, your leadership and everything, um, you know, wherever you start, U.S., um, U.K., uh, Europe? Uh, do you deploy somebody out there? Do you hire somebody out there? Um, uh, who here has uh, um, essentially tried to serve those markets pretty much from home with maybe just small infrastructure out there? So it seems like everybody has, has set up, you know, a, a real organization in, in the field. When you set up that organization in the field, um, who uh, you know, had somebody, probably a senior person, maybe it was somebody from the, from the, the, the founding team actually go out there to be part of it, to continue the culture, make sure that it could stick. So one, uh, for the other two, you guys kind of hired a, a new team out there. Is that, that kind of, kind of what you did? Uh, you know, I'd love to hear kind of your, your thoughts on these, because these are things that I think go through um, uh, a lot of people's minds. And as you can see, even just from this, with <laughs> there, there's been a lot of variety. And so I think one of the challenges is maybe not a right answer for, for some of these things um, uh, that are out there. Um, but uh, Alex, as, as you have, maybe not just with Haya, but with White Pages before, thought of, you know, that, that uh, expansion, um, how did you um, kind of approach this, this topic of, 
how to set up that organization, when is it going to be right so that it's at a scale where, you know, you're not going to look at it and say, holy cow, it's a big drain on my business. <laughs> you know, how, how do you make that, that type of trade-off? Sure, yeah. So, so whitepages.com is pretty much a US-only website. It, I mean, it's huge. There are 50 million users a month and so on, but it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's never really had to make the uh, international leap. Uh, for Hyatt, it's a very different story. And um, uh, I, I heard stories from friends, for instance, at, at an early stage, you know, nightmare scenarios in terms of, you know, one, one, one buddy of mine uh, started an, uh, an operation in Germany and uh, discovered uh, after six months that the team out there was working on a completely separate business half the time, you know, uh, 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 this was a media uh, company and they're working on some e-commerce business. And this has, had been going on for, for a few months. So stories like that really <laughs> made me sensitive to the fact that, uh, and, and you know, advice also that I received was, you know, make sure you hire someone trusted uh, uh, that you've known for a long time to, to lead the international operation. Um, in, uh, in our scenario, and, and really trying to live this, you know, international first mantra, uh, I just decided myself to, uh, 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 to go international. And um, yeah, so I, I set myself up on a WeWork office, or WeWork desk, I should say, here in London back in January. And then been building a team uh, uh, from there. Because um, that, you know, connective tissue is very important, not just from a trust factor, I think, but also, you know, in terms of, uh, being able to replicate the culture and, uh, and and company values across borders too, so you have good team efficiency, and um, uh, you can do that either by hiring someone trusted, or in my case, I just decided to uh, to go myself. No, it's it's interesting, and maybe Anker, you could talk about this because I think implied in the earlier statement that you had, which is you didn't want to go into geographies that were more than a three-hour plane ride away. How did you decide what controls you were going to put in the field versus what you were keeping at home? Because I think implied in that statement was a little bit of, hey, we wanted to be able to directly access those those places. And as you've, you've gotten further and further, has that had to change? Yeah. Uh, so I think um, it's, a, it's a, a balance that we are constantly trying to, to achieve. Uh, I think the question of, uh, of sort of uh, you know, founder-led expansion uh, is really the one that we have believed in. Uh, a lot of the big markets in our region um, are different enough that we've had to uh, sort of think of, uh, you know, founder-like profile uh, to lead and build those markets, uh, given the operational investment that's required, uh, the, uh, the government relations investment that's required, you're really operating at, uh, at very different levels uh, in the same day. Um, and that has allowed us to do that without having to build uh, a whole set of systems and controls and, uh, and so on, which we are only now, uh, over the last uh, kind of year, year and a half, uh, putting in place. Um, uh, because otherwise, uh, we, would have, um, we would have slowed down the pace of, uh, of expansion in these, uh, in these markets dramatically if we had tried to control everything ourselves. And sometimes, you know, the best way to, uh, to control, as, as Alex said, is just, just being there. And that's where the three hour um, uh, comes from, is that, you know, if you can go and have lunch uh, or spend a day or two every week, uh, then that's a much better control and a way to transition the, the uh, culture by osmosis than uh, having a rule set up in some ERP that you probably haven't set up the right way. Yeah, and, and this would be interesting to get your, your own perspective on this. Um, you know, the debate of some of what we're getting to almost comes down to like a fundamental question that I hear frequently with our portfolio companies, with others that, that I've worked at, which is, hey, do we build our strategy um, to go international and, and hire the home team and this type of thing? Or do I go hire somebody who's going to come in and own international and growth and they're going to set that, that strategy as, as part of hiring them? Um, you know, whether or not you're, you're personally doing this or it's something that, that you, you have an opinion on, who here is, is of the mind, you know, what, what we really need to do is we expand the businesses. We ought to hire a, a head of international. That person's going to, you know, have some prior experience and they're going to help us set that strategy, but we want to bring that person in. Who, who, who hires that person first and kind of sets that up? Either everybody else is sheepish on, on answering that or, or we have a, a single person uh, doing that strategy, which, by the way, this is very common. One of our portfolio companies right now is is asking this, this same question. Um, 
who uh, does it the other way around, which is to basically say, hey, we're, um, uh, we're going to develop that strategy, we're going to develop that organization, and yes, we may bring in some leaders that we're going to put into regions to come help do things, but you know, we already have uh, you know, the leadership in place with the head of sales or somebody else who owns you know, head of international um, uh, internally, and we're, we're not going to go add another role. Who, who, who comes from that, that strategy? And everybody else has no opinion on this. It's going to be hard to go international if you don't answer answer uh, one of those uh, one of those um, uh, two questions. Um, you know, Hugh, how, how have you thought um, uh, about you know that kind of trade off of you know kind of setting and and you know with the existing team, you know, you, you've got you know a, obviously a, a great um, head of sales. You got somebody. Um, here in Europe, who I think is in, in, in the audience in the back uh, today. How did you think about, you know, how to set that up, how to, how to set that strategy, and whether or not it's like, hey, I'm going to hire somebody to come in and do it for us versus, you know, kind of it's going to come inside out and we're going to have more junior folks uh, that are going to come into the field. Right. Um, so we had the luxury of uh, knowing very strong people that we had worked with before in different geographies. And so we were essentially able to go back and reassemble the band and um, you know, have somebody that we trusted and that was local, that knew the market, and that could build um, you know, an operation for us in our geography. Um, but I do subscribe actually to both philosophies. I think another way to do it, uh, which is kind of like what Alex was alluding to, is to invest the time to have key executives, maybe founders, uh, VPs, et cetera, uh, move into a new geography for a period of time, build an operation, transmit some DNA by osmosis, and once that has critical mass, then you have sort of good connection between the home office and the, the geographies, and it can become self-sustaining. And it's important to allow um, people from both sides to be able to visit the, the other offices and spend enough time that they get to know everybody. Because if you've actually physically been somewhere, worked with somebody, then a simple phone call later is much, much more productive than it would be if you were still quasi-strangers. And by the way, if, if I'm allowed to have an opinion, the, the style and what you're seeing, the team up here is a predilection of, of what I've observed to work and what, I, what I've preferred, which is, I think it's um, you know just foundationally hard to just go hire somebody else that's going to set a strategy, because number one, if you don't already have a perspective of how you're going to enter and be successful, how do you even know if you're going to be hiring the right person in the in the first place that can do that? Whereas the organizations that have historically been quite successful on their international expansion have, have usually started a little bit closer to home, developed an opinion and or, or a perspective. And then because there was leadership support for that, they could both hire the right people. And frequently this idea, what well, Hugh and Alex are, are ascribing to, which is, you know, they're usually also, if there's going to be a remote team, having somebody who is part of that inner circle of the leadership team of the organization has been there uh, from the early days, both for cultural reasons, to make sure there's consistency and you don't end up with the German problem that, that you mentioned. And, I've certainly seen a number of these, these horror stories. It'll be interesting that the, the guy who went into Brazil, it's one where I've definitely heard uh, you know, some challenges uh, with, with teams that have gotten deployed and, and um, independent there. Um, by, uh, by actually having that, you know, two things are, 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 are good. Number one, a lot of things you have to do actually at home in product, in you know, the rest of the organization. And if, if you haven't made those decisions beforehand, how are you going to go into a market with something that's prepared to be successful. Because if you're just like throwing over the fence, the chance that you show up two quarters later and really don't like the performance and then like have an allergic reaction and pull out, the number of times I've seen that type of reaction in, in board meetings, we already said you have to go international, but if you're already pulling out because of bad prior things, is that going to set you up you know, for long-term success? And then secondly, if that organization is treated like a redheaded stepchild and does not necessarily have the power or the communication or the, the access that others have, can they really be successful and are they really going to be able to drive and, and give feedback and get the types of care and feeding they, they, um, they, they need to succeed? Um, so I don't, like I said, I don't know if I was allowed to have an opinion, but part of the reason I wanted to overlay that because it's one of the things we've looked for and we've really appreciated about these companies and if you look at many of the companies in our, our portfolio it's a reason why we look for that 
and I think our portfolio companies have had quite a bit of success as, as a result of, of that. So just as a, as a rule of synthesizing that. Um, you know, I think we, we only have a few minutes left, and I'd love to just go down. Uh, you guys have all been around. There were things that you tripped on in the past that you fixed, you know, um, that, that were key learnings. I'd love to hear from each one of you, you know, like what was that, you know, one or two things that you learned a ton from that you would never make that mistake again on that, that might be interesting or helpful for, for folks in the audience to also not repeat your, your, your prior, uh, you know, observations um, for improvement. Yeah, gosh, I, I, don't, I don't know if, um, if I can say that we'll never do it again, because we probably will. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I think uh, in terms of expansion, as we've been talking about, getting the right people is, uh, is super, super critical. Uh, it's not always uh, e easy to, to do, because you have other things that you need to prioritize. But, uh, but having uh, the right bench that you can spare for expansion as and when the time comes, um, just three to six months prior to wanting to do it uh, is super, super important. Uh, and then making sure that you have uh, the right uh, cadence with which you manage uh, the, the team and the, the interaction uh, so, that, uh, uh, so that the market doesn't kind of go off out of hand as, uh, as Alex uh, referred to is very important. Okay, so um, like Ankur, I'm not sure I can say we will never repeat this, uh, but in a prior company, um, we had the um, exciting challenge of at one point having our entire Asia Pacific team poached by a competitor. So I would say the learnings from that are maybe um, stay very close to your remote teams so that you understand uh, what the dynamics are and you know when they're at risk, um, but you know we rebuilt, so it wasn't it wasn't traumatic as it could have been, uh, but it was a wake up call. Um, so I, I I agree with all these observations. Maybe to complement that a little bit too, um, I think I'd add that it's not just uh, and it's very important to hire the right folks to oversee the international expansion, but I'd, I'd also add that it's very important to make sure that they connect with the right mindset uh, at headquarters as well. Um, so uh, with us being an American headquarter company, uh, you know, the US uh, is where we have the most market share to date, and that's where most of the opportunity is. And, and there's going to be a lot of managers who always think US first, and everything else is second potatoes. And, um, and that really, I think, comes to the forefront when, when there's you know, all this friction in terms like different time zones and different languages and video conferencing is a hassle and, you know, uh, and so forth. Um, so you have to have a team at headquarters or managers who really care about the international growth. Uh, uh, I, 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 and I think that's especially important being an American company too because that international perspective just doesn't come easy. Um, you know, there's a lot of people in our company who've never traveled overseas. They all, 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 the only country they've been to is, is the United States. And, um, uh, and then I think the, the, the other thing I'd love to know, if I could teleport or just fast forward two years in the future, would be, uh, what about China? Um, so you know, what, what was highest learnings in dealing with China? Was it lost opportunity and we should have jumped in? Or if we did jump in, what did we learn from it? And I wanted to give enough time for there to be one or two additional uh, questions from the audience. Um, uh, anything, uh, as you've been hearing this conversation here, that, that's been popping to mind or, or that you are, are personally, you know, kind of approaching or wrestling with, um, love to have a bit of the brain trust here, you know, at least give their perspective on it. Well, everybody, everybody's uh, very quiet. Well, I'm going to call out. I'd love to hear from the, the guy who's gone into Brazil um, if, uh, if, if he's got a second. Um, nope. Brazil guy. I'd love, love to ask you about Brazil. So we, we actually like Brazil as, as, a, as a firm. We, we've invested in six companies that, that are, are headquartered in Brazil, and we've, we've – um, We've had a lot of success there, but I think you know one of the questions that we get, you know, when we talk to other VCs or even LPs that might invest in us, 
because they're like, oh my gosh, Brazil, you know, these types of markets, are, are they feel very risky. We don't know if we can get our money out. You know, the, the infrastructure, there's a perception, you know, whether or not, or it's like, you know, Mexico thing that, that we were talking about. You know, how have you looked at going to Brazil or markets like Brazil and said, um, you know, here's, here's the opportunity, here's why we feel like we've got confidence and we can get, um, get value out of doing it. Maybe tell a little bit about what, what, what your business is so it you know, gives a little bit of context. What other regions have you gone into uh, around the world? And how, how different has it been getting Malaysia versus going to Latin America? Are there any other questions from the audience? Yeah, over here. So I'll ask maybe one, one of the folks here, but before we do that, just to back this up with some, some statistics, and it's uh, very interesting. Um, if you, U.S. going international and Europe coming to U.S. or, or other places, um, that timing has come down pretty drastically over the last 10 to 15 years. If you go back um, to companies that were founded around the 2000 time frame in the United States, on average, those companies that were long-term durable companies were going outside the U.S. about seven or eight years into the, the life of the company. What you see today is with the crop of companies that have been most successful, that have gone IPO um, over the last couple years, those companies on average are now getting down to going international outside of the U.S. within about three years. And so it is certainly true, and th this is a bit of a reflection of the technologies that we're working in and the fact that they get pulled elsewhere and it becomes a bit of the um, quote unquote prisoner's dilemma of if you've got competitors that are going before you and they lock up those markets, it's going to be very difficult for you to win share. So that's why you see folks like Dropbox and others that have gone very quickly. In Europe, coming out, out of Europe uh, to other regions is actually now uh, for the most successful companies down to about two years. So it's even um, uh, more rapid um, coming, coming out, of, um, out of Europe. Well, Hugh, you, you, you've recently, over the last kind of 18 months, uh, you know, made kind of a concerted effort to go international. How did you think about that, and where was that in the timeline of, of your business? Sure. Um, so we were about uh, two years old when we hired our first UK employee. Sorry. Uh, we were about two years old when we hired our first UK employee, and we had about 40 employees in the company overall. And uh, it depends on what business you're in, but for us, um, I don't think we would have been ready to do it if we were much smaller in terms of headcount. Um, and so we started with that. We simultaneously uh, branched out into Canada, which for us is almost domestic. Uh, we just call it the North American market. And um, about four months ago, we started building a team in Asia Pacific. So that's essentially four years in. So that's how it's gone for us. And I think the decision actually depends on whether you're coming from the US or whether you're coming from somewhere else trying to go into the US. Uh, because I see a lot of organizations from outside the US that feel like 
the U.S. is going to be their primary market if they succeed. And so they probably want to make that move earlier rather than later. And just uh, something to, to keep in mind is that it's a little bit of how the dynamic of your space is, right? So if you've got competitors that are aggressively pursuing these things, if you look just at the stats, it's unusual for a competitive share shift to occur. So if somebody gets in and wins a bunch of the market, it's going to be hard for you to do anything but buy them to get their, their customer share. And so if you're in situations where that is likely to occur and you don't want to, be a, you don't want to eventually become a serial acquirer, that you're going to have to do things earlier. Whereas there's other markets where there isn't you know, natural competitors that are easy to come along. You look at DocuSign, they didn't have, you know, really strong competitors that were doing comparable products, so they could be a little bit longer in their, their rollout and they could go through an enterprise um, motion of, of doing that. So there's just some things to think about in terms of that dynamics and what it would imply if you do or do not do it. It's not to say that you can't, and like I said, an M&A strategy could work. It's just you essentially define yourself as having to do that if you want to be the, the global market leader. And, I and if I can add something, yeah. some types of business um, are easier to have multiple of the same in one geography, and some are harder. So for example, if you want to be an eBay, well, once eBay took over the US, there was no room to be the second eBay of the US. So you would have to find a different geography and say, I want to be the eBay of this other geography. Um, so that's not always true, but you have to consider, is your business one where it's easier to go somewhere else if you're not the first player, or whether it's easier to compete with the first player? And by the way, ride sharing is a good example of this, which is essentially it, there's only really room for two players because the behaviors of users essentially mean that, no, the, especially the drivers, will never install a third app. So you're either the number one or number two player or nobody else. And so the dynamics are really important um, in each one of the markets. Um, well, come, come find us afterwards. I think we've, we've uh, used up um, um, uh, our, our allotted time, and, and I want to be uh, sensitive to um, the next panels coming after us. But um, thank you for uh, being in a, an engaged audience. And um, uh, hopefully, you guys are all uh, going to be quite successful on your uh, global ambitions. Thank you. Thank you.